You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Med Rehabbers. Today, Dr. Jennifer Vitucci, who is the newest member to join the PulseVet team, joins me at our Vet Rehab Summit qualifiers last year. It was our 30 day lead up to the Vet Rehab Summit. We chat about PulseVet, the research behind their products, as well as answer questions from attendees. We also discuss their newest product and how it doesn't require sedation in patients, and as well as how well the patients actually tolerate this treatment. If you have not already, please come and join the largest vet rehab community online on Facebook. We've got four amazing groups, Small Animal Vet Rehabbers, Hydro Vet Rehabbers, Equine Vet Rehabbers, and the Business Vet Rehabbers. The links are in the description to this podcast. Guys, this is where vet rehabbers hang out online. They share research tips and advice. It's a great supportive community, and we'd love to see you online there with us. So over to my chat with Jennifer. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. Good morning. Um, today, we're joined by Jennifer from PulseVet, and we're going to be chatting a bit about um, PulseVet products um, and the company. You, so you're new to PulseVet. So I have interviewed Adrian once before, yes. um, but you're new. So you joined in May, right? Correct. I just started yeah. in the middle of May. So okay. I'm yeah. the newest and- member of the team, I think. <laughs> Tell us about yourself and your background. So I am a small animal general practitioner and a CCRT. And so my husband, who's also a veterinarian, actually, we owned a couple clinics, general practices in St. Louis, Missouri, for a long time and did surgeries and did some rehab there. And then, you know, personally, we had a big life change at the beginning of this year and we moved from Missouri to Florida. And so my husband took a new job and we left our clinic behind. And so I started on this new adventure with PulseVet. So it's been good. Awesome. So tell us a bit about the team. My, I love my team and that sounds really cheesy, but they're so wonderful and they work really, really, really hard together and everybody's strengths kind of balance each other. You know, we have a joke. I, I apologize to the equine rehabbers on here. I am a little bit terrified of horses, um, so I'm the resident small animal person at PulseVet, but I have my team that picks up the pieces of equine for me. You know, Trudy is um, my sales manager, and she's she's been a judge. She rides. She owns horses. So it's just been really, really fun. Everyone's spread out. Our headquarters is in Atlanta, just outside of Atlanta, but I live in Florida. Our marketing director lives in North Carolina. Trudy lives up in Michigan. Um, We have a couple people internationally as well in Switzerland. So it's just a really diverse team and everyone brings something a little bit different to the table. But at the base of it, everyone just really loves animals and wants to improve their health and their quality of life, you know. And so that's where everybody kind of starts. And then we just move forward from there. So it's really fun. I must say, I mean, I've obviously had um, um, conversations and dealt with PulseFit for many years, and I can really feel that um, (laughs) you guys are in it for the animals. So um, do you guys ever get together? We try to, obviously, with COVID, we haven't been able to mm-hmm. recently, um, but I do see everyone at trade shows and we do a lot of Zoom calls, but we are about to go to a big conference in December. So hopefully we will all actually be together, which is really exciting. Jennifer, why don't you tell us about your products? We sell an electrohydraulic shockwave device and we can go into the basics of shockwave if you need to, but it's basically a high energy sound wave and it affects, it's deposited into the tissues and it affects this at a cellular level and it causes all of these, I call them these happy healing enzymes, right? So these cytokines and growth factors are released and it causes all sorts of amazing effects in the tissue. And so our device that we have right now is called the ProPulse and we had the Versatron for a long time. So a lot of people are familiar with that. So the ProPulse came out in about 2016. So it's a a few years older now and it was smaller. It has a touch screen. It's behind me, but, um, and different trodes that we could use. Right. And so the trodes affect the depth and the penetration and the tissue volume that can be affected. 
And the most exciting thing that we were talking about before we came on air, especially in small animals, is this year we came out with a new trode that doesn't require sedation for the most part. So our traditional trodes work amazing, but they can be a little uncomfortable. If you've ever done shockwave on yourself or you've seen it done on someone, um, it's, you know, it can hurt a little bit. And so this new trode, we've redesigned the reflector. And so we've changed the peak energy and the focal area. And so we've just taken away a lot of the discomfort. And I think that's going to be a game changer, right? When you're a rehab vet, especially, you don't always have sedation handy. You don't always have the help to monitor patients. You know, it's just not as easy to do. And so being yeah. able to do it without sedation, I think is just going to make it more mainstream in practice and give us more opportunities to treat our patients than we were able to before. So I'm excited yeah. about that. I completely agree. I think it's a massive barrier. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously we have vet rehabbers come from all different backgrounds, so they mm -hmm. might be a vet physiotherapist yeah. um, and then they don't have access to, to, to uh, sedatives, or you might even have a vet in the practice. Um, and then, you know, a vet or a vet nurse needs to be monitoring that patient really while it's under sedation. And so, yeah, it just makes things a whole lot more complicated. The first time I ever experienced shockwave therapy was in 2010 at the Auburn IAVRPT conference. And, you know, I'm trying to think if it was Adrian that, that actually did it on me. I think I it might. Probably. <laughs> I, yeah, I think he was there. And I remember, like, I remember him saying, no, no, it's not sore. And it's not sore at all, you know? And I think he did it on like my elbow or something. And I was like, what? <laughs> that is so sore. It was so yeah. sore. And I remember thinking to myself, how would I ever do that on a patient, you know? Yeah. And because we never obviously want to be hurting our patients. So I love the fact that you've got this new um, toad because I really, really think for the small animals, it just makes things so much easier. Yeah. Um, to be able to treat them. And I, and I think that, you know, a lot of vet rehabbers maybe might not be even be thinking about it because they've been thinking, well, if I need to sedate the patient and I can't, mm -hmm. what's the point of having this modality if I can't use it? You know, exactly. I have to then get the vet and organize and then it just becomes you know, a big mission. So, yeah, that's really, really, really exciting. So how long has that trode been in use now? It started at the beginning of the year. So it kind of rolled out slowly. January, February, March, and then yeah. pretty much since May, that's what most, yeah. it's honestly like replaced the traditional trodes in a lot of our clinics that had them, you know, they were, they started using it and were seeing the same results and they were able to do it without sedation. So then they were like, oh, I don't even want to use the other trodes, you know, unless it's already sedated, like post surgery. Yeah. Um, and then so it's been out, it, what is it, October now? So yeah, almost a year. So one of the things you mentioned is that your um, system has an electrohydraulic system. What are the other types of systems that other shockwave have and what's the difference? Okay, so this is an important difference, right? So the two other most common in the veterinary world is piezoelectric and electromagnetic. Electromagnetic is a little bit more in horses and that one, it uses electronic impulse and magnets, kind of like a loudspeaker. And the piezoelectric is a big one in small animal. And what that does is it's vibrating crystals that create the impulse and create the energy. And so just to back up for a second about electrohydraulic. So we call it electrohydraulic, right? So we call it a spark plug in water. And in order to create that high energy sound impulse, you know, we kind of make the spark toad go off inside the fluid, which is inside the membrane. I'm just going to pull it off so I can show you. So inside here is where the spark toad is. And then there's fluid in this membrane. And so we create the sound wave. And then the important part is that it's focused, right? So we want to like deliver it to the tissue appropriately. And it has sort of the quickest rise time and the highest energy and the greatest focal zone. So I always tell people, this is kind of like your flashlight beam, okay? This end here. And then piezoelectric was actually developed to dissolve kidney stones in people. And so they wanted a really small focal zone and a high energy because we don't want to damage other tissues. And so the piezoelectric, it delivers energy in that kind of laser pointer 
amount. And so the reason that's important is because it changes our treatment protocols, right? So electrohydraulic, because we have this greater focal area, we're able to deliver a pretty large amount of energy in a shorter amount of time and over less treatments. Whereas piezoelectric, to get the same energy, you can do it. It just takes a little bit longer and you do the treatments more and more frequently. Okay. And um, so those are the two biggest differences between it. And the electrohydraulic is a true shockwave at all the settings. And piezoelectric and electromagnetic are not. It really has to be on a higher setting to affect those cells in the same way. Okay. Great. So we've got a few questions. Um, okay. So Bex has asked, when I've seen shockwave in practice, I've seen that some horses react to the noise of the device. In addition to being more comfortable for the animal, is your new device any quieter than previous devices? That's a really good question. And it is not much quieter. It's a little tiny bit quieter, but it still creates the same noise because we need to get the same energy through sound. Mm -hmm. And so even with those, we don't have to do this full sedation. Sometimes I know in small animal, we'll do like a little bit of an oral something just to take the edge off. We'll put cotton in their ears. Um, I've wrapped like towels around their head and being in a wide open area too can help um, kind of mitigate that noise. You know, I live in Florida. It's nice. So sometimes I'll go outside and treat, <laughs> and that's, you know, if you're in a small exam room with the door closed, like sometimes it echoes. So, but it's not much quieter because it is sound energy that you have to produce. And there's no way to muffle it because then no. the sound, the treatment's not <laughs> exactly. actually getting there. That's yeah. the other question too. They're like, can we wrap something around the trode? Um, but it doesn't work very well, you know, and we yeah. don't want to affect the energy going into the cells. Thanks for that. Okay. So I'm um, Trina Leg asked in one of our rounds, I'd love to learn more about shockwave and its effect on bone healing. I've used on an old ulnar osteotomy site, but can't measure the efficacy properly to truly know if it is working as I hope it would. I need to learn more about some specifics, such as if it could be used on gastrox Achilles when the hock is in an external fixator after repair from rupture and the use of um, polyglycan SA injected into articulary in the joint capsule post-surgery. Is it beneficial? Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for her? Sorry, there were lots of questions there. <laughs> I know. I'm like, <laughs> let me unpack all those questions. So, yeah, so let's, let's just go. Um, let's start um, with so, the bone healing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with the bone healing. Yeah. And so there is actually a ton of research on bone healing and shockwave therapy. It's one of the most common things in human medicine that they use for non-unions. And then we have our own research doing bone healing post TPLO and radiographic scoring them. And the dogs that received shockwave, all of their radiographic healing scores were statistically significantly better at eight weeks than the untreated. And so we know that at a cellular level, when the shock waves hit, that BMP is released, which is a cellular osteogenic growth factor. And so it really, really honestly works well for bone healing. So I would be surprised if it was not working for her old ulnar osteotomy. And so the same goes with like an Achilles injury that we're using the hawk. It's great for tendon and ligament repair. It's going to improve fiber alignment. And then it's also going to help heal that bone, whatever we used, you know, as our anchor for that repair. And so there's actually quite a bit of research on both the human and the veterinary side on its improvement in bone healing. And it's fine if the if you've got the external fixer tone. So correct. You correct. Use it on them, yeah. You just need to go around it. That's going to be the key. So there's going to be no damage if a shockwave hits a plate, a screw, an external fixator. But just like your ultrasound, it's going to bounce back, right? So you're not going to get to the tissues. And so you just need to find a way to hit those tissues, avoiding the external fixer, if that's possible. Um, yeah. You know, whether you come from the side or the top, because it's not going to hurt anything. You're just not delivering your sound, you know. And then the last one is using it um, when you're using um, injectables intra-articularly too. So if mm -hmm. you want to, can you use it post-surgically? Yes. And you can use it post-surgically. You can use it post-injection. Um, We've done studies showing that at recommended levels, we did it on a liposomal bucivacaine, that it doesn't 
you know, cause premature release of those. It doesn't affect PRP. There's actually some evidence in horses that it increases platelet activation. So to do a PRP injection and then hit it with shockwave, actually you can get better results. Um, but there's absolutely no, you know, I think they work best together. So there's no harm in using them together. Great. So obviously we've touched on a few um, ways in which, you know, different conditions we could use um, Shockwave. Are there any others that, that is, it's really useful? Like if you think about most practices, what are they mainly using the Shockwave for? Yes. Maybe we can do small animals and then we can touch on the equine <laughs> if you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can. We can touch on it. As long as you don't make me do it on the horse, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. The two biggest things I think that, and it depends on what your practice is, right? But a huge, huge, huge one that people love it for is our shoulder lamenesses. So our biceps, supraspinatus tendinopathies, because those are just really difficult injuries, right? And we can inject them and that works great, but it's a, it's a difficult joint to inject. And the shockwave has had, again, great research results on really improving those outcomes. And the, the exciting part to me about shockwave versus some of the other modalities, because, you know, we all believe in a multimodal approach, but it only takes two or three treatments till you have long-term healing. And so that's the nice part about the shoulders, right? And it's non-invasive and you get long-term results or almost complete healing if that's the way it's gonna go. And then the other huge ones are LS disease. So like cauda equina syndrome, you know, all of your lum lumbar pain and hip away. Um, we have some great pilot studies on non-neurologic back disease that were just amazing. And there's actually a big study going on at Ohio State right now on non-neurologic back pain in the shockwave. And they're having some really awesome results because that can just be debilitating. Yeah. So those are the, I would say the two most exciting ones, not as much in rehab, but if you lick granulomas, I don't know if you guys have that over there. It's not a yeah. rehab condition, um, but it, will heal like granulomas and that's sort of an aha for your clients as well we often see those together yeah. with pain right because they're yeah. often licking you know licking and causing the mm -hmm. granulomas when they've got pain elsewhere yeah um, so I, I i do acupuncture mm -hmm. and those ones are amazing i mean I, I was doing acupuncture in the rehab sense but I often got referred from vets skin cases mm -hmm. and they were always aqualic granulomas to have to do acupuncture. And I used to just look for the pain. So find the pain, treat the pain and the lick granulomas would sort out. So that's so interesting. I know because it's yeah. such a if you don't get to the root of the problem, right? Like nothing we do really works on lick granulomas. You know, you can take them off, you can do the DMSO, yeah. all the things and they don't, you know they don't go away so that's really really cool i believe yeah once people know that you can get rid of lick granulomas they'll refer their cases to you <laughs> I, I i actually i must pull it up because uh, i mean then they for the time when you had like um, phones with cameras so like i took these pictures and there was from like uh, the first digital cameras they were really bad the images weren't good but i've got like three pictures of like a chronic a um equilic granuloma and that I think it had been there for like three years and the, the vet didn't know. The vet had actually like actually surgically removed them to mm -hmm. try and sort it out. And the, the dog just kept licking, they just came back and they just became these chronic non-healing wounds. What you, what you actually do is I, I found pain in that dog's back and in his hips. And then you do a thing called fence the dragon where you put needles all around. So you literally put needles all around the aqualic granuloma and it completely went away. And I used to see that dog once a month. That's it. And it ne they never came back. So, so when you're doing the shockwave, are you just shockwaving like literally o right over it? Yeah. Right. Yep. Right over it. And yeah. to your point, you always want to assess the whole dog, right? The whole patient. Yeah. But you can actually shockwave right over the yeah. lick granuloma. And you the treatment's a little different. You do it every week um, until it's resolved. But it usually only takes about three treatments, maybe four. And yeah. And it resolves. And because the shockwave to me, it takes like an old wound and reinvigorates the healing, right? It brings the blood supply and all the things. So once your body has kind of given up on healing something and all that granulation tissue, this will come in and be like, okay, let's try again. You know, let's get rid of this. Um, 
and that and that's what it works on in lick granulomas i think i can completely see how it works if you think about it those edges like get yeah. so crusty and just like thickened and there's just no blood supply coming yeah. to that area you know yeah improves all the blood flow there mm -hmm. so we've got another great question can you use shockwave and laser in the same treatment you can use them together and in my mind if you're using them together it depends on what you're treating right just like i watched um Lori's right before mine and like you said she's so fun to like you, you can't help but get excited about laser when you're <laughs> probably talking about it um you can use them together absolutely and i think you're going to hit different penetrations and affect different mechanisms and so i know a lot of people will use you know, I always think of rehab as a whole appointment, right? You don't come in for a specific treatment. You come in and we're going to decide, like, what do we need to do for your dog? And so you can, you know, if you decide that day we're going to do laser and we're going to shockwave and we're going to do therapeutic exercise, you can do all of those things in the same day. I don't know that you need to. That's a separate question, but you can. And are there any conditions where it's contraindicated? You know, it's there isn't really. I will tell you that we have always in the past recommended, oh, you kind of avoid the heart and lungs, right? Because we're not exactly sure what it's going to do. But we are actually getting ready to publish a study that we did where we kind of, we shockwave lungs, right? We just held this shockwave straight against equine lungs and then did some histiologic testing to say, are we actually hurting these lungs? And we weren't. So we've kind of strayed away from that, at least in the sense that I don't know that you're going to treat anything in the lungs, but you don't need to be so careful. You're not going to do any damage. And actually in humans, super interestingly, they're starting to study shock waving heart muscle after heart attacks. Because, you know, if you think about it, once you have a myocardial infarction, your heart tissue is replaced with scar tissue, right? And so they're trying to see if they can get like more normal muscle and not scar tissue there, which we know that works in tendons and ligaments with shockwave. So there really isn't any super contraindications, right? You know, you probably don't want to go over cancer because we don't want to bring increased blood supply to that. And we always recommend we don't want to go straight over like a known disc. If there's a, you know, you can go along the apaxial muscles on either side, but we don't want to be right over that spine if we know there's a disc. We don't want to bring, you know, blood supply and create more acute changes. But those are the only two things. And there aren't really any side effects, which is nice. Sometimes they're a little bit sore. Sometimes there's a little bit of yeah. bruising, but for the most part, even in all the studies we've done and all of it, like you just don't hear anything more than that. So that part's nice to me. It feels really safe. Like you can't really do damage with this. Yeah. Too. So the owner would expect a sauna sort of 24 to 48 hours afterwards or... Yes, I will tell you in equine, they tend to get an analgesic effect. So for like two or three days, it is, they feel great. And that happens sometimes in dogs too, that they'll, you know, it'll be completely analgesic. And it's important in our patients because you know how owners are. They're like, oh, my dog feels great. Let's go for a three mile hike that we haven't done in <laughs> in three years. Um, and so then we create other problems. So it's important to mention that it's possible your dog's gonna feel amazing, but more commonly, I think in my own personal hands, they're a little bit sore for 24 hours, but nothing that an oral medication for that amount of time doesn't take care of. Yeah. So would you recommend that they use the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory yes. in that yes. time? Yeah. And those are not contraindicated. That's another question we get a lot. Like, yeah. you know, we're trying to stimulate, you know, healing and inflammation. So we don't want to use an anti-inflammatory, but all the patients we've done have been on anti-inflammatories. And so it's not contraindicated, you know, give them a non-steroidal to make sure that they're comfortable for the next couple of days. So, and then those conditions for the horses, so like mm -hmm. those treating horses, what conditions are mainly um, being treated with shockwave? And it's interesting because they do everything in horses, right? Um, especially your performance horses, they'll shockwave all sorts of things. But the biggest ones, they do a lot of backs, they do a lot of pulls, they do a lot of sacrums. Um, you know, horses, because they're bigger, we worry about these in dogs, but there's so much compensatory issues, right? So if one leg hurts, we're, our gates off and everything else is hurting. And so they use it a ton that way. And suspensory ligaments, it's great for those injuries. And kissing spines is a really big mm -hmm. 
issue in horses right now um, yeah. that respond really, really well to shockwave treatment. And is that an ongoing treatment in their butt kissing spans? You have to keep treating them? Usually what they recommend is we do a course of like two or three treatments and then that will last for a little bit longer. You know, it'll last a month, two months, three months. In dogs, we can have OA that lasts six months, right? And then we come back in and treat when they start to get painful again. On the flip side, I will say performance horses, you know, they treat pretty regularly, right? Like they yeah. preemptively treat, they treat post-performance. Um, they just want to make sure they're staying in a top shape for what they need to do. So they do it, I think, much more frequently in equines than we would do in our or need to do in our canine patients because their lifestyle is so different. So I'm going to put you on the spot because whenever I ask people this question, they're all like, I don't know how to answer that. Um, but um, what do you think is unique about PulseVet and their products? I think what's unique about PulseVet is that, you know, you spoke to Adrian a, a little bit ago on the podcast and it still holds very true. You know, he founded this because it was part of a human corporation and whenever you do that all the all the money that they make on the veterinary sides go into human research and he really wanted to advance veterinary medicine and so when we split off and started it like research is the number one thing in our company and i think i think that that's true in some companies but i just don't think it's as common as it should be. It's sort of like the overriding, you know, thing about pulse vet. Like we want to put our money where our mouth is. We don't want to tell you that these things work or recommend things, not proving it. And, yeah. you know, so I think that that's one of the most unique things that we really spend a lot of time, money and effort, you know, continuing it and thinking of new ways and making sure that people feel comfortable with what we're recommending and hopefully making you know, all of our patients' lives better. So, so you weren't put on the spot at all. No. <laughs> and, and, <it's> great. <laughs> and I just want to take this time too to thank you for inviting us to join. It's been really fun for me to, you know, see all the comments and see the posts yeah. and see the questions. It, these people are, you know, they're smart and they ask good questions and they bring up new ideas and it's, it's been really, really fun. And so I just commend you guys for putting it together. I, I've been really impressed with the whole format and it's gotten my mind thinking about a lot of different things. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. And I can't agree more. So when I read the comments, yeah. um, I'm just amazed at how clever our vet rehabbers are. <laughs> and I put the most amazing questions and I'll be like, oh, think of that you know i know it's um, like I, it's very very clever and a couple yeah. things i'm like oh man we should do a study about that you know yeah. like it, and that's a lot of what you've been talking about and we are actually yeah. thinking of doing studies for next year so i've been taking notes like oh that's a, that's a good objective outcome to use so it, i've been so, very impressed so this um this theme of ours obviously it carried on actually from last year because um Last year, we created um, a, a research group, basically, to try and facilitate research. Because um, one of the things that we found is that a lot of the vets, you know, um, they're not so, not not, a, not all of them, um, so some of them, um, the ones that are not that open to veterinary rehabilitation, maybe they haven't learned about it at university, maybe they're, you know, um, sort of the older school vets, they, they didn't learn anything about it. The only thing they're hearing about it is in continual professional development afterwards or at conferences. And, you know, they want the research. That's what they yeah. want. The vets want research. Um, and so this is really important for us um, in our field and our profession and as a community is that we need to get together and start getting the research out there. So it's other like great companies like yours, like PulseVet. Um, so thank you for all the research that you do because everything that you guys are doing um, helps the vet rehabbers to be yeah. able to treat animals because they they can say you know there is research behind this and there are a lot of things that we don't have research behind so yeah. we're just encouraging all the vet rehabbers out there just to get thinking think about it and um, ask these questions keep you know, when you're seeing cases keep questioning mm -hmm. and 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 you know we can look at maybe doing clinical um, clinical studies um, we don't necessarily have to have expensive paid research. If we can all get together from all over the world um, mm -hmm. and come together and say, like, if you've got three patients and someone's got five patients and we can get that all together, we can have a sample size of 100 yeah. um, and we can start looking and start um, picking up patterns 
and start having a look where we should be um, honing our ideas and research into. Very exciting. Um, And so, yeah, thanks for being a part. And thank you so much um, for joining me. I'm just going to check and see if there are any more questions there. And A says, hopefully there are some research ideas that vet rehabbers have come up with that PulseVet wants to collaborate with them. (laughs) Yeah. I've been been taking notes because I think that we should. And to your point, you know, I, it's so intimidating when you're in clinical practice. And I remember you're just like getting through your day. And so the thought of adding on or, you know, how am I going to get an end of a hundred or how am I going to do everything perfect? But if you can join forces, it's so much easier and it just will advance the whole, you know, thing together. And I do find it really interesting. You have those vets who even surgeons like, you know, don't touch my dog till it's eight weeks out or, you know what I mean? Even though there's all this research showing how early intervention helps, they still need to see it. We still need to prove it to them. So. But do you know what the great thing is? I mean, I've been um, in the field now since 2005 um, and I remember opening up my clinic in the early days and, you know, people just not having any idea what vet rehab was. Yeah. And I mean, I used to have vets that were just completely against what I was doing. They, they used to call me the hocus pocus vet in Cape Town. I used to think I was all like about like crystals and smoke and things like that. Seriously. Yeah. Um, and I mean I think it was probably from the acupuncture side of things. Yeah, I mean I used to have vets that would not even talk to me. I would go to the clinic and they would just tell the receptionist and I would hear them say, I don't want to talk to her. I've got nothing to say to her. I don't believe in what she does. Like I could hear exactly what they were saying from the waiting room. And I mean I remember just being like Oh, that's so hard to hear, but I thought I'm just going to keep going, you know, and then like year after year after year, then what will happen is maybe the they refer to a specialist and that specialist would refer to me. And then eventually I would have to have some communication with that person via email or, or sending a report. And then the client would give that vet feedback and then the vet would sort of start to open up. And then eventually there's one vet in particular that, I, that I'm thinking of. I ended up treating his dog. <laughs> He came to me like desperate, like my dog has been surgically operated on twice, not getting anywhere. I'm desperate. And this, you're the person. And, you know, and he apologized. He said to me, I'm really sorry. Like I, I was so closed to what you did. And so I think that it's just, we got to just persevere. So like every time, you know, we have vets like that, that are not open and they want the research. And sometimes we don't have it. And if we, if we have it, great. Some of the stuff is anecdotal that we, that we how we treat. Um, but you just got to keep persevering, keep yeah. persevering with them. And eventually they do open up because, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, what we do, we are successful and there is research, just not enough right now. Um, but, yeah, we just got to keep at it. Keep at it. And every little bit counts. Every little bit of research that we do, um, everything that we do towards the profession in the end, they will, they have to. I mean, yeah. I, I can't imagine them not <laughs> opening up their minds to it. Yeah. And when you're putting together research, you, you know, I think that sometimes the average vet or those vets, they don't realize how difficult it really is to control variables and make it perfect. So it makes sense. And it's statistical, you know, it's really, really difficult. And so to your point, a a lot of it is going to be anecdotal or case studies, you know, but how much anecdotal can you hear before you have to start believing that it's, you know, it's real. Yeah, and they always pull out the is it was it a double blinded placebo controlled study? You know, I, I I recall being at a lecture and I was lecturing and there was a veterinary physiotherapist lecturing and she they were asking like really nailing her about like all the research and she said yeah there is some research and they were, that's all they said every single time it's not a double blinded placebo controlled study because that is what we learned at university and it can't always be <laughs> so um, yeah so no. for those of you that are interested um kiki hausler she's the one that runs that research group so if you want to be a part of that guys there's actually a facebook group um about the research so please go and join on there they also have some conversations there I got another comment. I use my electromagnetic shockwave with laser in combination and it works well. Shockwave, especially in post-op cases, can be really beneficial. Thanks for that. No, I Jennifer, think it works great and it attacks all angles too. You know, we just actually did it. We had a great study 
that showed that it improved short-term limb use after TPLO. And what I think about is they, then you can start rehabbing earlier, right? If they're using that leg more, um, kind of like Dr. McCauley was talking about with the, with the laser, we're not hurting our other legs. We're able to not lose muscle as fast. We can get our hands in there as rehabbers. And it just, you know, improves the outcome tenfold when you can do all of that. Awesome. Jennifer, thank you so much. It's been amazing chatting to you. Thank you. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review. And know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers. So if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.